Hello everyone, welcome to a special edition, a Christmas Eve edition, of our first chapter Friday. As a treat, I'm going to read several chapters because the author goes between two main characters and I want you to get a feel for the story as she's telling it. The author is Marie Lu and this book is Legend. It's already in pre-production for a full-length movie and um, we did make a book trailer for it our book trailer Tuesday Club and I will add a link to that at the very end of this uh, reading. All right so here we are Los Angeles California Republic of America population 20 million one hundred seventy four thousand two hundred eighty two part one the boy who walks in the light day my mother thinks I'm dead. Obviously, I'm not dead, but it is safer for her to think so. At least twice a month, I see my wanted poster flashed on the jumbotron scattered throughout the downtown of Los Angeles. It looks out of place up there. Most of the pictures on the screens are of happy things. Smiling children, standing under a bright blue sky, tourists posing before the Golden Gate ruins. Republic commercials in neon colors. There's also anti-colonies propaganda. The colonies want our land, the ads declare. They want what they don't have. Don't let them conquer your homes. Support the cause. And then there's my criminal report. It lights up the jumbotrons in all of its multicolored glory. Wanted by the Republic. File number 462178-3233, day. Wanted for assault, arson, theft, destruction of military property, and hindering the war effort, 200,000 Republic notes for information leading to arrest. They always have a different photo running alongside the report. One time it was a boy with glasses and a head full of thick copper curls. Another time, it was a boy with black eyes and no hair. Sometimes I'm black, sometimes I'm white. Sometimes olive or brown or yellow or red. Whatever they can think of. In other words, the Republic has no idea what I look like. They don't seem to know much of anything about me, except that I'm young, and that when they run my fingerprints, they don't find a match in their databases. That's why they hate me. Why I'm not the most dangerous criminal in the country, but the most wanted. I make them look bad. It's early evening, but it's already pitch black outside, and the jumbotron's reflections are visible in the street's puddles. I sit on a crumbling window ledge three stories up, hidden from view behind rusted steel beams. This used to be an apartment complex, but it's fallen into disrepair. Broken lanterns and glass shards litter the floor of this room, and paint is peeling from every wall. In one corner, an old portrait of Elector Primo lies face up on the ground. I wonder who used to live here. No one's cracked enough to let their portrait of Elector sit discarded on a floor like that. My hair, as usual, is tucked inside an old newsboy cap. My eyes are fixed on the small one-story house across the road. My hands fiddle with the pendant tied around my neck. Tess leans against the room's other window, watching me closely. I'm restless tonight, and as always, she can sense it. The plague has hit the lake sector hard. In the glow of the jumbotrons, Tess and I can see the soldiers at the end of the street as they inspect each home. Their black capes shiny and worn loose in the heat. Each of them wears a gas mask. Sometimes when they emerge, they mark a house by painting a big red X on the front door. No one enters or leaves the home after that, at least not when anyone's looking. You still don't see them, Tess whispers. Shadows conceal her expression. In an attempt to distract myself, I'm piecing together a makeshift slingshot out of old PVC pipes. They haven't eaten dinner. They haven't sat down by the table in hours. I shift and stretch out my bad knee. Maybe they're not home? I shoot Tess an irritated glance. She's still trying to console me, but I'm not in the mood. A lamp's lit. Look at those candles. 
Mom would never waste candles if no one was home. Tess moves closer. We should leave the city for a couple weeks, yeah? She tries to keep her voice calm, but the fear is there. Soon the plague will have blown through, and you can come back and visit. We have more than enough money for two train tickets. I shake my head. One night a week, remember? Just let me check up on them one night a week. Yeah, you'll be coming here every night this week. I just want to make sure they're okay. What if you get sick? I'll take my chances. And you don't have to come with me. You could have waited for me back in Alta. Tess shrugs. Somebody has to keep an eye on you. Two years younger than me, although sometimes she sounds old enough to be my caretaker. We look on in silence as the soldiers draw closer to my family's house. Every time they stop at a home, one soldier pounds on the door while a second stands next to him with his gun drawn. If no one opens the door within 10 seconds, the first soldier kicks it in. I can't see them once they rush inside, but I know the drill. A soldier will draw a blood sample from each member of the family, then plug it in to a handheld reader and check for the plague. The whole process takes 10 minutes. I count the houses between where the soldiers are now and where my family lives. I'll have to wait another hour before I know their fate. A shriek echoes from the other side of the street. My eyes dart toward the sound and my hand whips to the knife sheathed at my belt. Tess sucks in her breath. It's a plague victim. She must have been deteriorating for hours because her skin is cracked and bleeding everywhere. And I find myself wondering how the soldiers could have missed this one during the previous inspections. She stumbles around for a while, disoriented, and then charges forward, only to trip and fall on her knees. I glance back toward the soldiers and they see her now. The soldier with the drawn weapon approaches while the 11 others stay where they are and look on. One plague victim isn't much of a threat. The soldier lifts his gun and aims. A volley of sparks engulfs the infected woman. She collapses, then goes still. The soldier rejoins his comrades. I wish we could get our hands on one of those soldiers' guns. A pretty weapon like that doesn't cost much on the market, 480 notes, less than a stove. Like all guns, it has precision, guided by magnets and electric currents, and can accurately shoot a target three blocks away. It's tech stolen from the colonies, Dad once said, although of course the Republic would never tell you that. Tess and I could buy five of them if we wanted. Over the years, we've learned how to stockpile extra money that we steal and stash away for emergencies. But the real problem with having a gun isn't the expense. It's that it's so easy to trace back to you. Each gun has a sensor on it that reports its user's hand shape, thumbprints, and location. If that didn't give me away, nothing would. So I'm left with my homemade weapons, PVC pipe slingshots, and other trinkets. They found another one, Tess says. She squints to get a better look. I look down and I see the soldier spill from another house. One of them shakes a can of spray paint and draws a giant red X on the door. I know that house. The family that lives there once had a little girl my age. My brothers and I played with her when we were younger. Freeze tag and street hockey with iron pokers and crumbled paper. Tess tries to distract me by nodding at the cloth bundle near my feet. What'd you bring them? I smile and I reach down to untie the cloth. Some, you know, some of the stuff that we saved up this week. It'll make for a nice celebration once they pass the inspection. I dig through the little pile of goodies inside the bundle and then hold up a used pair of goggles. I check them again to make sure there are no cracks in the glass. It's for John, an early birthday gift. My older brother turns 19 later this week. He works 14-hour shifts in the neighborhood's plant friction stoves and always comes home rubbing his eyes from the smoke. These goggles were a lucky steal 
from a military supply shipment. I put them down and I shuffle through the rest of the stuff. It's mostly tins of meat and potato hash that I stole from an airship's cafeteria and an old pair of shoes with intact soles. But John's the only one who knows I'm alive and he's promised not to tell Mom or Eden. Eden. Eden turns ten in two months, which means that in two months he'll have to take the trial. I failed my own trial when I was ten. That's why I worry about Eden, because even though he's easily the smartest of us three boys, he thinks a lot like I do. When I finished my trial, I felt so sure of my answers that I didn't even bother to watch them grade it. But then, the admins ushered me into a corner of the trial stadium with a bunch of other kids, and they stamped something on my test and stuffed me onto a train heading downtown. I didn't get to take anything except the pendant I wore around my neck. I didn't even get to say goodbye. Several different things could happen after you take the trial. You get a perfect score, 1,500 points. No one's ever gotten this. Well, except for some kid a few years ago who the military made a goody fuss over. Who knows what happens to someone with a score that high? Probably lots of money and power, yeah? You score between a 1450 and a 1499, pat yourself on the back because you'll get instant access to six years of high school and then four at the top universities in the Republic, Drake, Stanford, and Brennan. And then Congress hires you and makes you lots of money. Joy and happiness follows, at least according to the Republic. You get a good score somewhere between 1250 and a 1449 points, you get to continue on to high school, and then you get assigned to a college. Not bad. You squeak by with a score between 1,000 and 1249. Congress bars you from high school. You join the poor, like my family. You'll probably either drown while working the water turbines or get steamed to death in the power plants. You fail. It's almost always the slum sector kids who fail. If you're in this unlucky category, the Republic sends officials to your family's home. They make your parents sign a contract giving the government full custody over you. They say that you've been sent away to the Republic's labor camps and that your family will not see you again. Your parents have to nod and agree. A few even celebrate because the Republic gives them 1,000 notes as a condolence gift. Money and one less mouth to feed? What a thoughtful government. Except this is all a lie. An inferior child with bad genes is no use to the country. If you're lucky, Congress will let you die without first sending you to the labs to be examined for imperfections. Five houses remain. Tess sees the worry in my eyes and puts a hand on my forehead. One of your headaches coming on? No, I'm okay. I peer in the open window at my mother's house, and then I catch my first glimpse of a familiar face. Eden walks by, then peeks out the window at the approaching soldiers and points some handmade metal contraption at them. Then he ducks back inside and disappears from view. His curls flash white blonde in the flickering lamplight. Knowing him, he probably built that gadget to measure how far away someone is, or something like that. He looks thinner, I mutter. He's alive and walking around, Tess replies. I'd say that's a win. Minutes later, we see John and my mother wander past the window, deep in conversation. John and I look pretty similar, though he's grown a little starkier from long days at the plant. His hair, like most who live in our sector, hangs down past his shoulders and is tied back into a simple tail. His vest is smudged with red clay. I can tell Mom's scolding him for something or other, probably for letting Eden peek out the window. She bats John's hand away when a bout of her chronic coughing hits her. I let out a breath. So, at least all three of them are healthy enough to walk. Even if one of them is infected, it's early enough that they still would have a chance to recover. I can't stop imagining what will happen if the soldiers mark my mother's door. 
My family will stand frozen in our living room long after the soldiers have left. And then Mom will put on her usual brave face, only to sit up through the night, quietly wiping tears away. In the morning, they'll start receiving small rations of food and water and simply wait to recover or die. My mind wanders to the stash of stolen money that Tess and I have hidden, 2,500 notes. Enough to feed us for months, but not quite enough to buy my family vials of plague medicine. The minutes drag on. I tuck my slingshot away and play a few rounds of rock, paper, scissors with Tess. I don't know why, but she's crazy good at this game. I glance several times at my mother's window, but don't see anyone. They must have gathered near the door, ready to open it as soon as they hear the fist against the wood. And then the time comes. I lean forward on the ledge so far that Tess grips my arm to make sure I don't topple to the ground. The soldiers pound on the door. My mother opens it immediately and lets the soldiers in and then closes it. I strain to hear voices, footsteps, anything that might come from my house. The sooner this is all over, the sooner I can sneak my gifts to John. The silence drags on. Tess whispers, No news is good news, right? (laughs) Very funny. I count off the seconds in my head. One minute passes, then two, then four, and then finally ten minutes. And fifteen minutes. Twenty minutes. I look at Tess. She just shrugs. Maybe their reader's broken, she suggests. Thirty minutes pass. I don't dare move from my vigil. I'm afraid something will happen so quickly that I'll miss it if I blink. My fingers tap rhythmically against the hilt of my knife. Forty minutes. Fifty minutes. An hour. Something's wrong, I whisper. Tess purses her lips. You don't know that. Yes, I do. What could possibly take this long? Tess opens her mouth to reply, but before she can say anything, the soldiers are exiting my house, single file, expressionless. Finally, the last soldier shuts the door behind him and reaches for something at his waist. I suddenly feel dizzy. I know what's coming. The soldier reaches up and sprays one long red diagonal line on our door. And then he sprays another line, making an X. I curse silently under my breath and start to turn away. But then the soldier does something unexpected, something I've never seen before. He sprays a third vertical line on my mother's door, cutting the X in half. June, 1347 hours, Drake University, Batella, Sector, 72 Fahrenheit, degrees indoors. I'm sitting in my dean secretary's office again. On the other side of the frosted glass door, I can see a bunch of my classmates, seniors, all at least four years older than me, hanging around in an attempt to hear what's going on. Several of them saw me being yanked out of our afternoon drill at class today. The lesson, how to unload and load the XM-621 rifle by a menacing pair of guards. And whenever that happens, the news spreads all over campus. The Republic's favorite little prodigy is in trouble again. The office is quiet except for the faint hum coming from the dean secretary's computer. I've memorized every detail of this room, hand-cut marble floors imported from Dakota, 324 plastic square ceiling tiles, 20 feet of gray drapes hanging to either side of the glorious elector's portrait on the office's back wall, a 30-inch screen on the side wall with the sound muted and a headline that reads, Traitorous Patriots Group Bombs Local Military Station and Kills Five, followed by Republic defeats colonies and battle for Hillsborough. Arisna Whitaker, the dean secretary herself, is seated behind her desk, tapping on its glass. 
no doubt typing up my report. This will be my eighth report this quarter. I'm willing to bet I'm the only Drake student who's ever managed to get eight reports in one quarter without being expelled. Injured your hand yesterday, Miss Whitaker? I say after a while. She stops typing to glare at me. What makes you think that, Miss Ipparis? The pause in your keystrokes are off. You're favoring your left hand. Miss Whitaker sighs and leans back on her chair. Yes, June, I twisted my wrist yesterday in a game of keep a ball. Sorry to hear that. You should try to swing more from your arm and not from your wrist. I'd meant this simply to be a statement of fact, but it sounded sort of taunting and doesn't seem to have made her any happier. Let's get something straight, Miss Ipparis, she says. You may think you're very smart. You may think your perfect grades earn you some sort of special treatment. You may even think that you have fans at this school. What with all this nonsense? She gestures at the students gathered outside the door. But I've grown incredibly tired of our get-togethers in my office. And believe me, when you graduate and get assigned to whatever post this country chooses for you, your antics won't impress your superiors there. Do you understand me? I nod because that's what she wants me to do. But she's wrong. I don't just think I'm smart. I'm the only person in the entire Republic with a perfect 1500 score on her trial. I was assigned here to the country's top university at 12, four years ahead of schedule. And then I skipped my sophomore year. I've earned perfect grades at Drake for three years. I am smart. I have what the Republic considers good genes and better genes make for better soldiers, which makes for a better chance of victory against the colonies. My professors always say, and if I feel like my afternoon drills aren't teaching me enough about how to climb walls while carrying weapons, then, well, it wasn't my fault I had to scale the side of a 19-story building with an XM621 gun strap to my back. It was self-improvement for the sake of my country. Rumor has it that day once scaled five stories in less than eight seconds. If the Republic's most wanted criminal can pull that off, then how are we ever going to catch him if we're not just as fast? And if we can't even catch him, how are we going to win the war? Ms. Whitaker's desk beeps three times, and she holds down a button. Yes? Captain Matthias Ipparis is outside the gate. A voice replies, he's here for his sister. Good. Send him in. She releases the button and points a finger at me. I hope that brother of yours starts doing a better job of minding you, because if you end up in my office one more time this quarter, Matthias is doing a better job than our dead parents. I reply, maybe more sharply than I intended. We fall into an uncomfortable silence. Finally, after what seems like an eternity, I hear a commotion outside in the hall. The students pressed against the Doors glass abruptly disperse, and their shadows move aside to make room for a tall silhouette, my brother. As Matthias opens the door and steps inside, I can see some of the girls out in the hall stifling smiles behind their cans. But Matthias fixes his full attention on me. We have the same eyes, black with a gold glint, the same long lashes and dark hair. The long lashes work particularly well for Matthias, even with the door closed behind him, I could still hear the whispers and giggles from outside. It looks like he came from his patrol duty straight to my campus. He's decked out in his full uniform, black officer coat with double rows of gold buttons, gloves, neoprene sprecked lining, captain rank embroidery, shiny epaulets on his shoulders, formal military hat, black trousers, polished boots. My eyes beat his. He's furious. Ms. Whitaker gives Matthias a brilliant smile. Ah, Captain, she exclaims. It's a pleasure to see you. Matthias taps the edge of his hat in a polite salute. It's unfortunate it's under these circumstances again, he replies. My apologies. Not a problem, Captain. The dean's secretary waves her hand dismissively. What a brown noser. 
especially after what she just said about Matthias. It's hardly your fault. Your sister was caught scaling a high rise during her lunch hour today. She wandered two blocks off campus to do it. As you know, students are used to only camping, climbing walls on campus for physical training, and leaving the campus in the middle of the day is forbidden. Yes, I'm aware of that, Matthias interrupts, looking at me out of the corner of his eye. I saw the helicopters over Drake at noon and had a suspicion June might have been involved. There actually have been three helicopters. They couldn't get me off the side of the building by scaling it themselves, so they pulled me off with a net. Thank you for your help, Matthias says to the dean's secretary. He snaps his fingers at me, my cue to get up. When June returns to campus, she'll be on her best behavior. I ignore Ms. Whitaker's false smile as I follow my brother out of the office and into the hall. Immediately, students hurry over. June, a boy named Dorian says as he tags alongside us. He'd asked me unsuccessfully to the annual Drake Ball two years in a row. Is it true? How high did you get? Matthias cuts him off with a stern look. June is heading home. And then he puts a hand firmly on my shoulder and guides me away from my classmates. I glance behind me and manage a smile for them. Fourteen floors, I call back. And that gets them buzzing again. Somehow, this has become the closest relationships I've had with other Drake students. I'm respected, discussed, and gossiped about. Not really talked to. Such is the life of a 15-year-old senior in a university meant for 16 and up. Matthias doesn't say another word as we make our way down the corridors, past the manicured lawns of the central quad and the glorious elector statue, and finally through one of the indoor gyms. We pass by the afternoon drills that I'm supposed to be participating in. I watch my classmates as they run along a giant track surrounded by a 360 degree screen, simulating some of the desolate war front road. They're holding their rifles out in front of them, attempting to load and unload as fast as they can while running. At most other universities, there wouldn't be so many students soldiers, but at Drake, almost all of us are well on our way to career assignments in the Republic's military. A few others are tapped for politics and Congress, and some are chosen to stay behind and teach, but Drake is the Republic's best university, and seeing as how the best are always assigned into military, our drill room is packed with students. By the time we reach one of Drake's outer streets, and I climb into the back seat of our waiting military jeep, Matthias can barely contain his anger. Suspend it for a week? Do you want to explain this to me? He demands. I get back from a morning of dealing with the Patriot rebels, and what do I hear about? Helicopters two blocks from Drake, and a girl scaling a skyscraper? I exchanged a friendly look with Thomas, the soldier in the driver's seat. Sorry. I mutter. Matthias turns around from his place in the passenger seat and narrows his eyes at me. What the hell were you thinking? Did you know you'd wandered right off campus? Yes. Of course. You're 15. You went 14 floors up a... He takes a deep breath, closes his eyes, and he steadies himself. For once, I'd appreciate it if you would let me do my daily tours of duty without worrying myself sick over what you're up to. I try to meet Thomas's eyes again in the rearview mirror, but he keeps on his gaze on the road. Of course, I shouldn't expect any help from him. He looks as tidy as ever with his perfectly slicked hair and perfectly ironed uniform, not a strand or thread out of place. Thomas must be several years younger than Matthias and subordinate on his patrol, but he's more disciplined than anyone I know. Sometimes I wish I had that much discipline. He probably disapproves of my stunts, even more than Matthias does. We leave downtown Los Angeles behind and travel up the winding highway in silence. The scenery changes from inner Batalis sector's hundred floor skyscrapers to densely packed barrack towers and civilian complexes, each one only 20 to 30 stories high, with red guiding lights blinking on their roofs most with all their paint stripped off after this year's rash of storms. 
Metal support beams crisscross their walls. I hope they get to upgrade those supports soon. The war's been intense lately, and with several decades of infrastructure funding diverted to supply the warfront, I don't know if these buildings will hold up well in another earthquake. After a few minutes, Matthias continues in a calmer voice. You really scared me today, he says. I was afraid they'd mistake you for day and shoot at you. I know he doesn't mean this as a compliment, but I can't help smiling. I lean forward to rest my arms on top of his seat and say, Hey, I say, tugging his ear the way I did when I was a kid. So I made you worry. He lets out a scornful chuckle, but I can tell his anger's already fading. Yeah, that's what you say every time, Junebug. Is Drake not keeping your brain busy enough? If not, then I don't know what will. You know, if you just take me along on some of your missions, I'd probably learn a lot more and stay out of trouble. Nice try. You're not going anywhere until you graduate and get assigned your own patrol. I bite my tongue. Matthias did pick me once, once for a mission last year, when all third-year Drake students had to shadow an assigned military branch. His commander sent him to run a runaway prisoner of war from the colonies. So Matthias brought me along with them, and together we chased the POW deeper and deeper into our territory, away from the dividing fences and the strip of land running from Dakota to West Texas that separates the public and the colonies, away from the war front where the airships dot the sky. I tracked him into an alley in Yellowstone City, Montana, and Matthias shot him. During the chase, I broke three ribs and had a knife buried in my leg. And now Matthias refuses to take me anywhere. When Matthias finally speaks again, he sounds grudgingly curious. So tell me, he whispers, how fast did you climb those 14 stories? Thomas makes a disproving sound in his throat, but I break into a grin. Storms passed. Matthias loves me again. Six minutes, I whisper back to my brother, and 44 seconds. How do you like that? That must be some sort of record. Not that you know you're supposed to do it. Thomas stops the Jeep right behind a line at a red light and gives Matthias an exasperated look. Come on, Captain, he says. June, a Miss Epperus won't learn a thing if you keep praising her for breaking the rules. Cheer up, Thomas. Matthias reaches over and claps him on the back. Surely breaking a rule once in a while is tolerable, especially if you are doing it to beef up your skills for the public's sake. Victory against the colonies, right? The light blinks green. Thomas turns his eyes back to the road. He seems to count to three in his head before letting the jeep go forward. Right. He mutters, You should still be careful about what you're encouraging. Ms. Ipparus to do, especially with your parents gone. Matthias's mouth tightens into a line, and a familiar strained look appears in his eyes. No matter how sharp my intuition is, no matter how well I do at Drake, or how perfectly I score in defense, in target practice, and hand-to-hand -hand combat, Matthias's eyes always hold that fear. He's afraid that something might happen to me one day, like a car crash that took our parents. That fear never leaves his face, and Thomas knows it. I didn't know our parents long enough to miss them in the same way Matthias does. Whenever I cry over losing them, I cry because I don't have any memories of them. Just hazy recollections of long adult legs shuffling around our apartment and hands lifting me from my high chair. And that's it. Every other memory from my childhood, looking out the auditorium as I receive an award, or having soup made for me when I'm sick, or being scolded or tucked into bed, those are worth the ties. We drive past half of our Batala sector and then through a few poor blocks. Can't these street beggars stay a little farther away from our jeep? Finally, we reach the gleaming, terraced high rises of Ruby and we're home. Matthias gets out first. As I follow, Thomas gives me a small smile. See you later, Ms. Ipparus, he says, tipping his hat. 
I stopped trying to convince him to call me June. He'll never change. Still, it's not so bad being called something proper. Maybe when I'm older, Emmatias doesn't faint at the idea of me dating. Bye, Thomas. Thanks for the ride. I smile back at him before stepping out of the jeep. Matthias waits until the door has slammed shut before turning to me and lowering his voice. I'll be home late tonight, he says. There's tension in his eyes again. Don't go out alone. News from the war front is that they're cutting power to residences tonight to save energy for the airfield bases. So stay put, okay? The streets will be darker than usual. My heart sinks. I wish the Republic would hurry up and win this war already so that for once we might actually get a whole month of non-stop electricity. Where are you going? Can I come with you? I'm overseeing the lab at the Los Angeles Central. They had delivered vials of some mutated virus there. It shouldn't take all night. And I already told you, no, no missions. Matthias hesitates. I'll be home as early as I can. We have a lot to talk about. He puts his hand on my shoulders, ignoring my puzzled look, and gives me a quick kiss on the forehead. Love you, Junebug, he says, his trademark goodbye. And then he turns to climb back into the Jeep. I'm not going to wait up for you, I call after him. But by now, he's already inside, and the Jeep's falling away with him inside of it. Be careful, I murmur, but it's pointless to say. Now, Matthias is too far away to hear. Day. When I was seven years old, my father came home from the war front for a week's leave. His job was to clean up after the Republic soldiers so that usually he was gone and Mum was left to raise us boys on our own. When he came home that time, the city patrols did a routine inspection of our house, then dragged Dad off to the local police headquarters for questioning. They'd found something suspicious, I guess. The police brought him back with two broken arms, his face bloody and bruised. Several nights later, I dipped a ball of crushed ice into a can of gasoline and let the oil coat the ice in a thick layer and lit it. And then I launched it with a slingshot through the window of our local police headquarters. I remember the fire trucks that came whizzing around the corner shortly thereafter, and the charred remains of the police building's west wing. They never found out who did it, and I never came forward. There was, after all, no evidence. I had committed my first perfect crime. My mother used to hope that I would rise up from my humble roots, become someone successful or famous. I'm famous, all right, but I don't think it's what she had in mind. It's nightfall again, a good 48 hours since the soldiers marked my mother's door. I wait in the shadows of a back alley, one block from Los Angeles Central Hospital, and watch its staff spill in and out of the main entrance. It's a cloudy night with no moon, and I can't even make out the crumbling bank tower sign at the top of the building. Electric lights shine from each floor a luxury only government buildings and the elite's homes can afford. Military jeeps stack up along the street as they wait for approval to enter the underground parking lots, and someone checks them for proper IDs. I keep still, my eyes fixed on the entrance. I look pretty awesome tonight. I'm wearing my good pair of shoes, boots made of dark leather worn so soft over time, with strong laces and steel shoes. Bottom with the 150 notes from our stash. I've hidden a knife flat against the sole of each boot. And when I shift my feet, I can feel the cool metal against my skin. My black trousers are tucked into my boots and I carry a pair of gloves and a black handkerchief in my pocket. A dark long sleeve shirt is tied around my waist. My hair hangs loose down my shoulders. This time I've sprayed my white blonde strands a deep black, as if I dipped them in crude oil. Earlier in the day, Tess had traded five notes for a bucket of pygmy pig's blood from the back alley of a kitchen. 
My arm, stomach, and face are smeared with it. I've also streaked mud on my cheeks for good measure. The hospital spans the first 12 floors of the building, but I'm only interested in the one without windows. That's the third floor, a laboratory, where the blood samples and medicines will be. From the outside, the third floor is completely hidden behind elaborate stone carvings and worn Republic flags. Behind the facade lies a vast floor with no halls and no doors, just a gigantic room, doctors and nurses behind white masks, test tubes and pipettes, incubators and gurneys. I know this because I've been there before. I was there the day I failed my trial. The day I was supposed to die. My eyes scan the side of the tower. Sometimes I can break into a building by running it from the outside. If there are balconies to leap from and window ledges to balance on, I once scaled a four-story building in less than five seconds. But this tower's too smooth with no footholds. I'll have to reach for the lab from inside. I shiver a little even in the warmth and I wish that I'd asked Hess to come with me. But two trespassers is easier to catch than one. Besides, it's not her family who needs the medicine. I check to make sure that I've tucked my pendant beneath my shirt. A lone medic truck pulls up behind the military jeeps. Several soldiers climb out and they greet the nurses while others unpack the truck's boxes. The leader of the group is a young, dark-haired man dressed in all black, except for two rows of silver buttons that line his officer jacket. I strain to hear what he's saying to one of the nurses. From around the lake's edge, the man tightens his gloves. I catch a glimpse of the gun at his belt. My men will be at the entrance tonight. Yes, Captain, the nurse says. The man tips his cap to her. My name's Matthias. If you have any questions, come see me. I wait until the soldiers have spread out around the hospital's perimeter, and the man named Matthias has immersed himself in conversation with two of his men. Several more medic trucks come and go, dropping off soldiers, some with broken limbs, some with gashes on their heads or lacerations on their legs. I take a deep breath, and step out of the shadows and stumble toward the hospital's entrance. A nurse spots me first, just outside the main doors. Her eyes dart to the blood on my arm and face. Can I, can I be admitted, cousin? I call to her. I wince at an imaginary pain. Is there still room tonight? I can pay. She looks at me without pity before she returns to scribbling on a notepad. Guess she doesn't appreciate the cousin affection. An ID tag dangles from her neck. What happened? She asks. I double over when I reach her and I lean on my knees. Was in a fight, I say panting. I think I got stabbed. The nurse doesn't look at me again. She finishes writing and then nods at one of the guards. Pat him down. I stay where I am as two soldiers check me for weapons. I yelp on cue when they touch my arms or stomach. They don't find the knives tucked in my boots. They do take the little pouch of notes tied to my belt, my payment for entering the hospital, of course. If I was a goody rich sector boy, I'd be admitted without charge. Or they'd send a doctor for free straight up where I live. When the soldiers give the nurse a thumbs up, she points me toward the entrance. Waiting rooms on the left, have a seat. I thank her and I stumble toward the sliding doors. A man named Matthias watches me as I pass. He's listening patiently to one of his soldiers, but I see him study my face as if out of habit. I make a mental note of his face too. The hospital is ghostly white on the inside. To my left, I see the waiting room, just like the nurse said, a huge space packed with people sporting injuries of all shapes and sizes. Many of them moan in pain. One person lies unmoving on the floor. I don't want to guess how long some of them have been here or how much they've had to pay to get in. I note where all the soldiers are standing, 
two by the secretary's window, two by the doctor's door far in the distance, several near the elevators, each wearing ID tags, and then I drop my eyes to the floor. I shuffle to the closest chair and sit. For once, my bad knee helps my disguise. I keep my hands pressed against my side for good measure. I count ten minutes off in my head, long enough so that new patients have arrived in the waiting room and the soldiers are less interested in me. And then I stand up, pretend to stumble, and lurch toward the closest soldier. His hand reflexively moves to his gun. Sit back down, he says. I trip and fall against him. I need a bathroom, I whisper, my voice hoarse. My hands tremble as I grab his black robes for balance. The soldier looks at me in disgust while some of the others snicker. I see his fingers creep closer to his gun's trigger, but one of the soldiers shakes his head. No shooting in the hospital. The soldier pushes me away and points toward the end of the hall with his gun. Over there, he snaps. Wipe some of that filth off your face, and if you touch me again, I'll fill you with bullets. I release him and nearly fall to my knees. Then I turn and stagger toward the restroom. My leather boots squeak against the floor tiles. I can feel the soldier's eyes on me as I enter the bathroom and lock the door. No matter. They'll forget about me in a couple minutes, and it'll take several more minutes before the soldier that I'd grabbed realizes that his ID is missing. Once in the bathroom, I abandon my sick routine. I splash water on my face and I scrub until most of the pig's blood and mud have come off. I unzip my boots and I tear open the inner soles to reveal my knives and tuck those into my belt. My boots go back on my feet. And then I untie the black collared shirt from my waist and put it on, buttoning it all the way up to my neck and clipping my suspenders over it. I pull my hair back into a tight ponytail and tuck the hair into the shirt so it's pressed flat against my back. Finally, I pull my gloves on and I tie a black handkerchief around my mouth and nose. If someone catches me now, I'll be forced to run away. Might as well hide my face. When I finish, I use the tip of one of my knives to unscrew the cover to the bathroom's ventilation shaft. And then I take out the soldier's ID tag clip it to my pendant necklace, and I stuff myself headfirst into the shaft's tunnel. The air in the shaft smells strange, and I'm grateful for the handkerchief around my face. I inch along as fast as I can. The shaft can't be more than two feet wide in any direction. Each time I pull myself forward, I have to close my eyes and remind myself to breathe, that the metal walls around me are not closing in. I don't have to go far. None of these shafts will lead to the third floor. I only need to get far enough to pop out into one of the hospital stairwells, away from the soldiers on the first floor. I press forward. I think of Eden's face, of the medicine that he and John and my mother will need, and of the strange red X with the line through it. After several minutes, the shaft dead ends. I look through the vent, and in the slivers of light, I can see pieces of a curved stairwell. The floor is an immaculate white, almost beautiful, and most importantly, empty. I count to three in my head, then bring my arms as far back as I can and give the shaft cover a mighty shove. The cover flies off. I get one good glimpse of the stairwell, a large cylindrical chamber with tall plaster walls and tiny windows one enormous spiraling set of stairs. Now I'm moving, with all speed and no stealth. Run it! I squeeze out of the shaft and then dart up the stairs. Halfway up, I grab the railing and fling myself to the next highest curve. The security cameras must be focused on me. An alarm will sound any minute now. Second floor, third floor. I'm running out of time. As I approach the third floor, I tear the ID tag off my necklace. And I pause long enough to swipe it against the door's reader. The security cameras haven't triggered any alarm in time to lock down the stairwell. The handle clicks and I'm in. I throw open the door. 
I'm in a huge room filled with rows of gurneys and chemicals boiling under metal hoods. Doctors and soldiers look up at me with startled faces. I grab the first person I see, a young doctor standing close to the door. Before any of the soldiers can point a gun in our direction, I whip out one of my knives and I hold it close to the man's throat. The other doctors and nurses freeze. Several of them scream. Shoot and you'll hit him instead. I call out to the soldiers from beneath my handkerchief. Their guns are now focused on me now. The doctor trembles in my grasp. I press my knife harder against his neck, careful not to cut him. I won't hurt you, I whisper in his ear. Tell me where to get the plague cures. He lets out a strangled whisper, and I can feel him sweating under my grip. He gestures towards the refrigerators. The soldiers are still hesitating, but one of them calls out to me. Release the doctor, he shouts. Put your hands up. I want to laugh. The soldier must be a new recruit. I cross the room with the doctor and then stop at the refrigerators. Show me. The doctor lifts a trembling hand and pulls the refrigerator door open. A gust of freezing air hits us. I wonder if the doctor can feel how fast my heart is beating. There, he whispers. I turn away from the soldiers long enough to see the doctor pointing at the top shelf in the fridge. Half of the vials on the shelf are labeled with the three-lined X, a T the Lovardin virus mutations. The other half of the vials are labeled 11.30 cures, but all of the vials are empty. They've run out. I curse under my breath. My eyes skim other shelves. They only have plague suppressants and various painkillers. I curse again. Too late to turn back now. I'm letting go, I whisper to the doctor. Duck. I release my grip and shove him hard enough to make him fall on his knees, and the soldiers open fire. But I'm ready for them. I hide behind the open fridge door as bullets ricochet off. I grab several bottles of suppressants and I shove them into my shirt. I bolt. One of the stray bullets scrapes me, and a searing pain shoots up my arm. I'm almost at the exit. An alarm goes off as I burst through the stairwell door. There's a chorus of clicks as all the doors in the stairwell lock from the inside. I'm trapped. The soldiers can still come through any door, but I won't be able to get out. Shouts and footsteps echo from inside the laboratory, and a voice yells out, He's hit! My eyes jump to the tiny windows in the stairwell's plaster walls. They're too far away for me to reach from the stairs themselves. I grit my teeth and I pull out my second knife so that I now have one in each hand. I pray the plaster soft enough, and then I leap off the stairs and throw myself toward the wall. I stab one knife straight into the plaster. My wounded arm gushes blood, and I scream from the effort. I'm dangling halfway between my launching place and the window. I rock back and forth as hard as I can. The plaster is giving away. Behind me, I hear the laboratory door burst open and the soldiers spill out. Bullets spark all around me. I swing toward the window and I let go of the knife buried in the wall. The window shatters and I'm suddenly out into the night again and falling, falling, falling like a star to the first floor. I rip open my long sleeve shirt and I let it billow out behind me as thoughts zip through my head. Knees bent, feet first, relaxed muscles, hit with balls of feet, roll. The ground rushes up at me and I brace myself. The impact knocks the wind out of me. I roll four times and crash into the wall on the other side of the street. For a moment, I lie there blinded, completely helpless. Above me, I can hear furious voices coming from the third floor window as the soldiers realize they're going to have to double back into the laboratory to disable the alarm. My senses gradually sharpen. Now, 
I'm very aware of the pain in my side and arm. I use my good arm to prop myself up and wince. My chest throbs. I think I've cracked a rib. When I try to stand, I realize that I've sprained one of my ankles, too. I can't tell if it's adrenaline keeping me from feeling all the other effects of my fall. Shouts come from around the building's corner, and I force myself to think. I'm now near the rear of the building, and several alleys branch off behind me into the darkness. I limp into the shadows. When I look over my shoulder, I see a small group of soldiers rush to where I'd fallen, pointing out the broken glass and blood. One of the soldiers is the young captain I saw earlier, the man named Matthias. He orders his men to spread out. I quicken my pace and I try to ignore the pain. I hunch my shoulders so that the black of my outfit and hair help me melt into the darkness. And my eyes stay down. I need to find a sewer cover. The edges of my vision are blurring now. I push one hand against my ear and I feel for blood. Nothing yet, a good sign. Moments later, I catch sight of a sewer cap on the street. I heave a sigh, readjust the blank handkerchief covering my face, and bend down to lift the cover. Freeze! Stay where you are! I whirl around to see Matthias, the young captain from the hospital's entrance facing me. He has a gun pointed straight at my chest, but to my surprise, he doesn't fire it. I tighten my grip on my remaining knife, and something changes in his eyes, and I know he recognizes me, the boy who had pretended to stagger into the hospital. I smile. I have plenty of wounds for the hospital to treat now. Matthias narrows his eyes. Hands up! You're under arrest for theft, vandalism, and trespassing. You're not going to take me in alive. I'd be happy to take you in dead if you prefer. What happens next is a blur. I see Matthias tense up to fire his gun. I throw my knife at him with all of my strength. Before he can fire, my knife hits him hard in the shoulder, and he falls backward with a thud. I don't wait to see him get up. I bend down and heave the manhole cover up, then lower myself down the ladder into the blackness. I pull the sewer cover back into place. My injuries are catching up to me now. I stumble along in the sewers, my vision going in and out of focus. One of my hands presses hard against my side. I'm careful not to touch the walls. Every breath hurts. I must have cracked a rib. I'm alert enough to think about which direction I'm moving in and concentrate on heading toward the lake sector. Tess will be there. She'll find me and help me to safety. I think I can hear the rumble of footsteps overhead, the shouts of soldiers. No doubt someone's discovered Matthias by now, and they might have even headed down into the sewers too. They could be hot on my trail with a pack of dogs. I make a point to take several turns and walk in the filthy sewer water. Behind me, I hear splashes and the sounds of echoing voices. I take more turns. The voices get a little closer, then farther. I keep my original direction planted firmly in my mind. It would be something, wouldn't it, to escape the hospital, only to die down here, lost in a gaudy maze of sewers. I count off the minutes to keep myself from passing out. Five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes, an hour. The footsteps behind me sound far away now, as if they're on a different path than I am. Sometimes I hear strange sounds, something like a bubbling test tube and a sigh of steam pipes, a breath of air. It comes and goes. Two hours, two and a half hours. When I see the next ladder leading up to the surface, I take my chances and pull myself up. I'm in real danger of falling now. It takes all of my remaining strength to drag myself onto the street. I'm in a dark alley, and when I've caught my breath, I blink away my fuzzy vision and study my surroundings. I can see Union Station several blocks away. I'm not far now. Tess will be there waiting for me. Three more blocks. Two.
more blocks. I have one more block. I can't hold on any longer. I find a dark spot in the alley and I collapse. The last thing that I see is the silhouette of a girl off in the distance. Maybe she's walking toward me. I curl up and begin to fade away. But before I black out, I realize that my pendant is no longer looped around my neck. That, folks, is all I'm going to give you, and I really doubt that it didn't hook you. So please continue the story. Definitely watch our trailer that we made and, you know, see if we did a decent job representing the book. And I wish you all a fantastic Christmas and great vacation for all who are on it. Take care.